All right, hello, I'm uh, Jonathan Hooper. Uh, I am the uh, engineering lead for uh, login.gov and I'm real excited to have the opportunity to come here, uh, talk about uh, login.gov, what we do on login.gov, uh, especially what we do uh, with the uh, WebAuthn and FIDO and some of the tools that we have there. Uh, so I wanna take a little bit of time to go into uh, you know, who we are, uh, if you don't know uh, what login.gov is and what we do, uh, talk a little bit about our FIDO implementation. Uh, we set it up about three years ago, uh, so we have some experience, uh, go into some of the things that we've observed uh, over the past three years and some problems that we've had uh, and problems that we're actually uh, in the process of working on right now. Who are we? Login.gov is a uh, single sign-on platform for government services. Uh, we also provide identity verification. Uh, overall, overall, our goal is to simplify secure access uh, and we are public facing. Uh, so we are looking at people uh, in the US uh, trying to access you know, things like USA Jobs, SAM.gov, uh, the uh, Social Security Administration, uh, services like that that are available to the public online. Uh, so we provide uh, uh, authentication and uh, identity verification. And um, we're also working at uh, taking advantage of some of the economies of scale that can come from being across the entire government and uh, reducing the costs for agencies. Uh, so right now, there are a just over 30 million uh, user accounts on login.gov. We uh, hit that milestone sort of recently. Uh, we do somewhere between 100 and 150 million sign-ins uh, every day. So we, uh, we have a lot of exposure there to people who are actually coming in and authenticating. We are in front of uh, two, oh, just over 200 uh, sites across the government. Uh, and that is spread across uh, 27 different agencies. Uh, and one of the big parts of our offering is multi-factor authentication. Every single login.gov account is going to have to be MFA enabled. Uh, and our big goal there is to one, provide you know, secure uh, access, like I said in, in the, the mission statement, but um, also to be able to meet users where uh, they are. Uh, so we want to make it easy to set up the most secure possible method of authentication. Uh, so we support things like WebAuthn. Uh, we also support PivCAC for people who have them, uh, these sort of things that are phishing resistant. But we also recognize that uh, not everybody is going to have a security key uh, or even a smartphone or even be able to uh, receive uh, SMS uh, messages. So. We also support a, uh, a, a set of other options. Um, and we try to build our uh, interface such that people are encouraged to choose the most secure option uh, that will work for them and make that the lowest friction uh, path. The uh, OMB draft uh, Federal Zero Trust Strategy, if you haven't seen it, uh, has some, whenever that, that came out, I believe a week or two ago, uh, and there was some language in there that we found very uh, reaffirming uh, of our approach, right? They specifically said users expect government services to give them the tools uh, that they can use to protect themselves, uh, which like I said, is exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, meet people where they are and give them the things they need to set up a secure account and make the most secure uh, possible account the easiest thing for them to do. The strategy also mentioned that uh, there will be requirements for providing WebAuthn, uh, or at least the option of having a WebAuthn enabled account to uh, uh, applications that are facing the public, uh, which is very exciting for us because uh, we have that and also very reaffirming because uh, we set that up. Uh, actually, yeah, we set it up in 20, like I said, in 2018. Um, and uh, rolled it out then and have been steadily tweaking it over time. Uh, we, had, we had a little bit of a slowdown in our ability to improve our uh, authentication and multi-factor uh, stuff because of COVID, uh, but we're back at it now. I'm excited to show you some of the, the things that we've done. So 
Why did we set up WebAuthn? Well, at the time, 2018, login.gov was starting to have, a, starting to grow rapidly. Uh, its user base was starting to grow rapidly. And we were starting to see an increase in phishing. Um, and so we were investigating ways that we could reduce phishing on the platform, which led us to uh, WebAuthn. Uh, so the, we discovered it through kind of looking at this phishing, these phishing resistant options. Uh, WebAuthn also has uh, a lot of cool privacy stuff built into it. And at login, you know, we, we don't want to be big brother. We want to make sure that we can protect users' privacy and the, uh, the things built into the protocol that help to do that uh, were very uh, attractive to us. And then also WebAuthn is um, very, very cheap. It is much cheaper uh, to do a, uh, a WebAuthn authentication than it is to do uh, SMS by several orders of magnitude. So we got really excited about it. Um, and we saw like, a, yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, opportunity there and we're really interested to see how it could uh, develop over time and wanted to get into the space. So we set it up. Uh, this is what the uh, enrollment flow looks like today after a person sets up an account. Uh, so they confirm their email address, they set a password, they do all the kind of typical things you expect to do in an account setup flow. They get to this authentication method setup page. Uh, and at the very top is the security key option. And you probably can't see that because it's very tiny, uh, but that little green label on there says more secure. Um, so all the label, all the, the options have like a little rating for how secure they are. Um, and we put them in this, this order. Uh, so security keys at the very top, you select that. Uh, you get to this uh, screen here, where we prompt you to add your security key. Uh, users can have multiple keys on login.gov. So we uh, prompt you to give your key a nickname. So, you know, is this, you know, the, the blue key or the black key or whatever. Uh, you then um, hit continue and we go through the uh, browser WebAuthn uh, enrollment flow where the, the key starts uh, blinking. Uh, the browser prompts you to push the button, you push the button uh, and then you move along uh, once that's done. Uh, on verification, after you sign in, uh, whenever it's time to MFA, we prompt you to connect your security key. You click on the uh, use your security key button and then we go through that same browser uh, verification uh, flow. It looks exactly like the enrollment experience where the browser prompts you to push the button. The key starts blinking. You click on the key and then we have this, uh, hey, we verified your key uh, screen. And then you uh, hit continue and go along and do whatever it was that you were trying to do. Uh, with login.gov. Uh, and then within our account, we also have a component here for managing your security keys. Like I said, you can have multiple keys. So you can go to your account screen to add keys uh, and also to remove them. Uh, if you add a key, you go through the exact same enrollment flow. So that's the flow today. Um, we want to talk about some of the stuff that we are thinking about, some of the things that we're, uh, we're working on and what we've observed. The first thing I want to talk about is adoption. Uh, and I imagine a lot of people who are doing WebAuthn uh, with the public already know where this is going uh, because uh, it's, it is difficult to, um, to sort of get people to, to go through the flow and get people to know what it is. Um, and uh, this next slide might hurt a little bit. And that's because it has the uh, setup key page conversion rate on it, uh, which on login.gov right now is 1.6%. Uh, and what that means is 1.6% of people who go to that page, the security key setup page, the one where you put in your nickname, actually successfully make it to the next step, uh, having set up a security key. So, um, incredibly, incredibly low conversion rate on that page. And it gets a lot of traffic. Um, so I, I wanna say something like 80K uh, a month. Uh, so 80K users are looking at the screen every month. Uh, only 1.6% of them actually set up a key. Um, and so to add to a, a little bit of the frustration there, of those users, 62.2% uh, have a device that could function as a uh, platform authenticator. Uh, so they're, they're showing up with a device that has, uh, you know, like a 
a newer iPhone that has touch ID or face ID or like a newer uh, Android phone that could function as a platform authenticator or Windows Hello or something like that, right? Um, and that's actually a really good story. Whenever we, uh, we talked about this to the FIDO Alliance in 2019, I believe, uh, that number was 6%. Uh, so roughly 6% of the users who showed up uh, to login.gov generally had a platform authenticator. And now we're looking at over 60%. So more than a 10% increase uh, in support for platform authenticators, but still a low conversion rate. Um, so why is that? Or why, why do we think that is? And what are we working on uh, to improve that? Uh, well, the big thing is, like I said, we encourage people to set up the most secure factor available to them and make that the easiest path. So the security key option is the first option. Uh, we label it the more secure option. It really, really encourage users to uh, select it. Whenever we built this page, that's the thing that we were optimizing for, people selecting the security key. And so it works, people select the security key, but then they get there um, and they don't have a key. Uh, they don't know what a security key is, you know, um, and they go back and they inevitably select something else. There's a silver lining there because people are uh, interested in uh, setting up a more secure factor and pushing people into more secure factors does seem to work. It actually gets them to where they need to be. Uh, they uh, just don't have the hardware uh, that they need, which takes me to platform authenticators, which could work, um, except for whenever we implemented uh, the, uh, our, our FIDO integration, we supported platform authenticators, but ended up actually quietly dropping support for that as the um, distinction between whether you were doing a platform authenticator uh, setup or a roaming authenticator setup became more important. At the time we implemented it, most devices were either platform authenticators or roaming authenticators. So we didn't need to specify that in the request of the browser, but the world has changed. Uh, and now a lot of uh, implementations don't actually, um, don't actually distinguish uh, or do distinguish that. And they, they need that, um, that part of the request. So we need to say, hey, I, I want to authenticate with a roaming authenticator or I want to authenticate with a platform authenticator or the browser will, will refuse to cooperate with you. Um, so what we need to do is add the option to set up a platform authenticator to this screen uh, to enable people to do that. Um, and that is easy, right? I mean, we just add a new option if the browser supports a security key. Um, and then let the user set up a platform authenticator. But there is a reason uh, that we are kind of holding off on that. And that is because before we start pushing more web authentic adoption, we want to make sure that we have a good recovery story. Because this is another one of the problems we see with these keys. They're very easy to lose. Um, it's also like very easy to have multiple uh, authenticators. Um, so like have a key, have multiple keys, set up one phone as a platform authenticator, buy a new phone and not be able to log in, all that kind of stuff. So we wanna make sure we're uh, informing users uh, about their recovery options whenever they set up and what sort of caveats come along with setting up uh, a, a web authentication. token. Uh, and um, we're also very excited to see some of the people who are on the other side actually building authenticators tackling this problem too, uh, which makes it easier for us. Uh, for example, the uh, the Apple announcement with the uh, pass key uh, implementation uh, of WebAuthn where the uh, keys are actually stored in iCloud. Uh, so if a user does drop their phone in the ocean uh, or simply buy a, buys a new phone, uh, they can use iCloud to actually access their uh, the keys that they use for authentication. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there, uh, especially around supporting platform authenticators. Like I said, people are coming to set up the more secure methods. Uh, we just need to put the tools into their hands uh, that they need to, um, to actually do that. Uh, and platform authenticators at this point look like that's the, the way because the security keys just are, we have not uh, reached saturation yet. The other thing uh, that is kind of interesting that we're looking at is this uh, concept of phishing resistant accounts versus phishing resistant uh, transactions. This is a feature request we started getting from um, our partners, which is very cool to have them come and talk to us 
about uh, about ways to have phishing resistant authentication methods. So they come to us and they say, hey, I have a use case where I can reasonably expect my users to have access to the technology. They need to do a more secure uh, authentication. Uh, so like a security key or a government employee ID. Uh, and I want to require them to use that, right? So we have actually started, we built an experimental uh, flow where the users are required whenever they're setting up a method um, for one of these service providers, you know, they're required to select one of these phishing resistant methods. And if a user signs in who already has an account but doesn't have one of these phishing resistant methods, we have a, uh, a interface in here where they can actually add a phishing resistant method. And this creates kind of an interesting problem because uh, login.gov, like what we want to do is we want to be the one account for government. Uh, but now we have people who are signing in uh, to these uh, places where they're required to have, they're required to use phishing resi resistant authentication, right? But they might still have their account linked to other applications that don't require that, right? And they uh, may want to have uh, some other method like SMS or something like that at, or TOTP uh, as a fall, as a convenience, I guess, for their, uh, their applications that don't require more secure authentications. And that uh, SMS or TOTP uh, configuration on their account adds a phishing vector. Um, it, uh, because there's this problem where if um, I sign into the account that uh, requires phishing resistant auth, I have to use my key, but I can sign to other ones with SMS. I still have SMS on my account. That means that somebody who's phishing me just fishes the less secure account, right? Uh, they fish my SMS code, then they have access to my account. They can add their own phishing resistant authentication and use that to, to, uh, to do a phishing resistant transaction at the, uh, the place that requires uh, stronger authentication. We have been uh, looking at ways to address this because like I said, we really want to have this one account model. So one of the things we looked at is kind of this sub account concept, which is this idea of you have an enclave within your account or a sub account or something like that, uh, where it's like, this is the phishing resistant space, right? So in order to make changes to the sub account, you have to authenticate with one of your more secure methods. Um, so in order to add a, 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 uh, a FIDO token, you have to um, authenticate with an existing FIDO token, which has a lot of drawbacks uh, that we've, we've sort of discovered. Uh, for one, it's a very hard mental model to build with users, right? Like the account within an account, it's not really intuitive, uh, doesn't make sense. And people don't wanna spend a lot of time on login.gov trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, also the recovery story is really rough. Like what happens if I have one, uh, one security key set up on my account uh, and I have my SMS, right? And I lose my security key, right? Now I need to somehow figure out how to recover my sub account, but not my, uh, my main account. Um, so that gets very, very tricky too. So um, what we are kind of settling on is this idea of making accounts uh, phishing resistant being a, uh, a best practice because it's just really, like I said, really non-intuitive to have the sub-account thing going on. And it really seems like something that is too easy uh, to get wrong uh, and open the door to some kind of attack. Uh, so it does break down the phishing, uh, the, or sorry, it does break down the one account uh, for government model. Uh, people still can use one account, right? They can use their their account that has been put into this phishing resistant mode everywhere, right? They just don't have the convenience of the other methods, um, which is fine. If they want to use the if they want to use the other methods, they can set up uh, a second, less uh, secure uh, account. So that's uh, that's all the stuff that we've been looking at over the past three years. Uh, like I said, it's a 
Uh, we're really excited to be in this space. Uh, really excited to see all of the things that are happening uh, around us as we're working on this uh, and developing it. And thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you.